Well, thank you, Mike, very, very much for inviting me. And thank you, everyone, for coming from Canada, New Zealand, Germany, Wimbledon, and such other exotic places. So thank you very, very much indeed. Um, uh, so this is going to be a talk on fairgrounds and theatre. I'm a theatre historian, but I'm also a book historian and an editor. So I'm going to give you a tiny, tiny bit of background about why uh, I became interested in this subject. And then I'm going to talk to overheads, which I'll show you on screen sharing. Can I just check first, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, okay, fantastic. Um, so as an editor, um, and I'm a Shakespeare editor, I'm one of the general editors of the next iteration of Arden Shakespeare, Arden Shakespeare 4. And as an editor, I was very conscious of the fact that when you footnote a Shakespeare text, um, you footnote it always with the highest literature you can. So when you want to explain a line, you go, oh, I think maybe this has a parallel in Virgil. You know, this could be a Spencer reference. I was very conscious that Shakespeare was a writer for a popular medium and that popular entertainment, we don't know so much about it and we don't tend to footnote it. And as a result, Shakespeare's literature turns higher and higher and we kind of lose some of the fun and the entertainment value that his plays also had. So originally I started looking at fairs as a way of trying to locate popular entertainment in London. Um, and, and the project sort of grew beyond that, but that's what Shakespeare is doing sitting in this project. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about now. Um, so I'm just going to open screen share. Um, and uh, so this is the title, Playing Fair. Um, and it's going to have three parts, theatres and fair, then fairs in theatre, and then theatres in fairs. I'll introduce all of the three parts and explain what's going on. Um, but firstly, I'm going to look at theatres and the London fairs and their connection, their strange and odd connection with one another. Um, so I'm going to start with just some basic information. This is um, uh, Bartholomew Fair, and that's one of the huge London fairs that you may well have heard of. And technically that happened on two days, the 24th and the 25th of August every year. But in fact, it often extended to about um, two weeks. Um, then there's this other fair, and that is Southwark Fair. Uh, now, technically, that happened on the 7th, 8th and 9th of September. But in fact, that also tended to extend to about two weeks. So if you look at this, we have two major London fairs, each lasting up to two weeks, and one starting, therefore, pretty soon after the other. In fact, we've kind of got a month of fairground activity in London, because basically Bartholomew Fair closes down and then reopens in Southwark as Southwark Fair. So we've got an enormous amount <clears throat> of London Fair happening. Um, now, what does London think of uh, its fairground um, activity? Uh, I'm not going to read all of this, don't worry. Um, but, but what this is, is this is a text which describes the huge activity that goes on in advance of Southwark Fair, where the Lord Mayor and the sheriffs, uh, the Lord Mayor wears his collar of S's without hood, the sword bearer wears the embroidered cap and carries the pearl sword. So basically you've got the Lord Mayor of London opening the fair with the biggest ceremony he possibly, possibly can. And here we have the opening of Bartholomew Fair, and it's the same enormous ceremony, aldermen, mayors, gowns, cloaks. Um, and the reason I'm pointing all of this out, that the Lord Mayor opens both those huge fairs, is because um, the Lord Mayor really hated the theatre. He was forever, uh, the mayors of London were forever trying to close down London theatres. Um, uh, they tended to be pure, uh, the mayors tended to be of a puritanical bent. They were really worried by the gatherings of people at theatres. So there's a big question, why would 
um, the Lord love uh, fairgrounds hates us so much. Um, and of course, one answer is going to be a trade answer. You, there's, uh, fairgrounds are just incredibly good for London. They bring in all sorts of different trades. Uh, they bring in lots of people. They are economically fantastic in a way that the theatre isn't. Um, and here's just a picture of what it might have looked like at the start of a London fair. This is um, what the Lord Mayor looks like uh, when he's parading around um, and when he's got the sword bearer in front of him. So you can see that this is enormously ceremonial. And there were other really weird ceremonies that also accompanied the start of London Fair and involved the mayor. There was wrestling, um, there was a release of rabbits. Um, uh, for one of the fairs, the Lord Mayor would have to drink a ceremonial glass of lemonade, um, which we know about because um, one of the mayors, his horse shied and he fell off and died. So that was a that was a poor beginning to to the fair at that time. But anyway, this enormous ceremony to start the beginning of that that fairground month in London. Um, this is a picture of the South Bank in London. It's a bit of a map. You can see the Thames there at the top, and you can see London Bridge uh, going across it. Now on the right of the map. That's where Southwark Fair would be, the fair on the South Bank. On the left of the map, you can see um, St. Mary Overy's Church. That still stands, that's now Southwark Cathedral. And to the left of that, you can see the Bear House and the Playhouse. So you can see uh, that London's theatres and entertainments um, are largely settled um, outside the walled city of London, and here they are, settling in the South Bank. And as you know, the, the globe ended up there, the rose. Um, and that was a very theatre area. I think one reason why entertainment went to that South Bank was precisely because it already was a, a fairground place, that it already had this association with entertainment. But I'll tell you something much odder about um, theatre and fairgrounds um, uh, than that. I'll read this out. Um, it says, a fair on the bank side, when the playhouses have two penny tenants dwelling in them. Now what that means um, is that um, when, when the, the fairgrounds opened, the playhouses would shut. And in fact, they went on shutting for the entire month of fair, of fair time. But the two penny tenants dwelling in them while they are shut, um, this apparently, this appears to be um, uh, that the, the, the theatres become kind of youth hostels um, and that uh, they become bedding down places for people who want to go to the fair. Um, that's interesting, both because the playhouses are having this very different use. But it's also interesting because you can see that the, play, the playhouses are subservient to the fair. Um, they have to give way to the fair and then they have to herald and help the fair. And that tells us something interesting about that hierarchy between playhouses and fairgrounds, which we also saw in the fact that the Lord Mayor loved fairs, um, uh, hated theatres. And that makes us maybe wonder about something else. Um, this is a picture of the Globe Theatre in, in London, Shakespeare's original Globe. And the only reason why I'm showing it is that it is round. And we often talk about those round theatres um, and we tend to wonder whether the roundness um, is designed to be classical and it clearly is, it's designed to recall a, a classical theatre. Um, but it is equally, um, uh, it equally recalls round entertainment tents at fairs um, and here we have a tavern tent in a fairground. So I think what is interesting about the shape of theatres is that they're simultaneously high and low culture and that they're sort of um, appealing to, fair, to fairgrounds and to lovers of fairgrounds just as much as they are appealing to lovers of classicism. Um, now another really, really weird thing about fairs, given that they're temporary uh, and given that they're annual, is that uh, and given that they then go away, is that they had their own legal system. 
And this was also a legal system that markets had. And the legal system was known um, as the court of pie powders. Um, definition of it, and then I'll talk to you a little more about it. Pie powders court signifieth the court held in fairs for the redress of all disorders committed within them, which hath the name of dusty feet, so pied poudre, uh, dusty feet, which we commonly get by sitting near the ground. So the dusty feet court or the pie powders court is a temporary court presided over by real judges and with a jury, a jury made up of booth holders in the fairground. So uh, we have this amazing court, which is referred to um, and, and thought of a great deal. Um, here's Ben Johnson's play, Bartholomew Fair, where we hear, is this well, Goody Joan, to interrupt my market in the midst and call away my customers? Can you answer this, are the pie powders? So the pie powders court. Um, but that gives the fairground also a sort of prestige, also a kind of enormity, that is again maybe surprising. Um, and uh, I'm now going to show you the kind of punishment that might be meted out by a fairground court. This is about Grig, a poulter, who was on the 8th of September set on the pillory in Southwark. And the Lord Mayor and the Alderman riding through the fair, he asked them and all the citizens forgiveness. So basically, he'd done a misdemeanor in the fair and his punishment was to be publicly shamed. He had to sit on a pill pillory and he had to beg all the bigwigs um, for forgiveness. Well, that's, um, we can see that that's a sort of a fun punishment for other people as well, because it's slightly entertaining. But here's something interesting. We now swap to the theater and here we're hearing, um, and, and this is a text written by the clown, William Kemp. And he talks of this. He talks of a noted cut purse, such a one as we tie to a post on our stage for all the people to wonder at when at a play they are taken pilfering. So what he says is that when someone in the audience is pilfering, cutting purses, uh, they are tied um, uh, to a post on the stage so that they can be publicly shamed. So you can see that the, the theatre here has borrowed uh, the legal system from the fair. It actually has no right to do that. Um, and to me, it's very odd and fascinating to think of uh, malefactors stuck on the stage and presumably um, uh, making comments and remarks at the play that's, that's going on in front of them. But it also says interesting things about those pillars on the stage as being part of the structure, but also part of the punitive uh, nature of the theatre. Uh, my interest though is that once again we see the theatre following after um, uh, the fair and borrowing from it. And we see it in other ways too. Um, here for instance is a definition of uh, the fun liquids that you can buy at the fairground reminds me to have a sip of my own beer. Their double beer and bottle ale in every corner had good sale. So you could buy beer at the fairground and that's no surprise. But now we're swapping to the theatre. This is a description of a base mercenary poet and poet was the word for playwright at that time. This is a playwright who, when he hears his play hissed, he would rather think bottle ale is opening. Um, of course, you open the bottle and that releases a hissing sound. He hopes it's that rather than that his play is terrible. But actually, my interest here is in the fact that just as you get beer in the um, fairground, so you can buy that same uh, liquid in the theatre. Same goes for snacks. Here we are at Bartholomew Fair. Uh, a rattle, half a bushel of nuts, uh, so you could buy nuts in the fair. And here we are at the theatre where at the playhouses betwixt the acts, the music room is drowned with these nut cracks. Uh, everyone cracking nuts. Um, two things I do not understand about this quotation um, and, and the last. One is uh, you could clearly buy nuts um, in fairs and theatres. I don't know how you cracked them. Did you always 
happen to have your nutcrackers on you, um, I'm guessing there must be some way, these are hazelnuts we're talking about, I'm guessing there must be some way that could have been cracked with that, but I don't know where, how to do that. Similarly, I wonder how people did open their bottle ale. Um, was there some way you could simply slip the top off? Or again, did you have implements with you for doing that? But um, we can talk about that later. Uh, what I do want to say is the food and the drinks in the fairs um, and in the theatres, these are fun um, treat, uh, treat food and drinks. And again, we seem to see the theatre hurrying to offer what the fairground does. And now here's a weird and odder parallel. This is a description of a bookseller's shop um, at Bartholomew Fair, uh, the stalls of which are adorned with Bibles and prayer books. Um, well, why on Bartholomew's day would you be buying Bibles and prayer books? Uh, this could be because you're thinking of the Bartholomew massacre and that makes you feel a little reflective. But I think there's another reason. Um, fairgrounds are sort of naughty places, but maybe you can allow yourself your day of fun drinking beer at the fairground if you come home with a Bible and a playbook. So I think um, there was a good trade in religious literature because that sort of excused people's um, uh, presence at the fairground. And let's now look at the theater. I shall live to see thee stand in a playhouse door with thy long box, thy half crown library, and cry small books by a good godly sermon, gentlemen, a judgment shown upon a knot of drunkards, a pill to purge out popery, the life and death of Catherine Stubbs. So this is a list of the of the books you can buy in the playhouse. And as you see, they're, they're all holy, holy books, finger wagging books, um, uh, and anti-papal books. Uh, uh, Catherine Stubbs was a, a martyr. So it's sort of the same thing that that you can you can get an apology or an excuse for having fun in the theater because the souvenir you bring back is a sermon. So what this has shown, I hope, is that theater and fairground are enormously similar and sort of close to one another, but that in the sort of hierarchical battle between them, um, the fairground is coming out as sort of the winner. Uh, I mentioned that because we, we tend to think the, the reverse. We tend to imagine that, that, that literature, that, that theatre is literary and sort of a formal and, and respected. But that's, that's not what the information seems to be telling us here. Um, well, so who goes to these places? Uh, roughly the same people. Uh, just as Lent is to the fishmonger, so is Bartholomew Fair to the pickpocket. It is his high harvest. So no surprise, pickpockets go to fairs. Um, they, they get very good trade there. Um, likewise, uh, here's a little song about it. Prostitutes go to fairs. To not amiss while Smithfield Fair doth hold, that jades and drads together all were sold. And now let's go to the theatre. Oh look, it's the same again. Who they are which run, mon which run madding unto plays are the boards to entice, the whores and courtesans to set themselves to sail, the cut purse to steal, the pickpocket to filch. So there we have it. Uh, we've got the same low audience, we've got the same high audience, uh, we've got the same snacks, we've got the same books, um, We've got the same pseudo legal system or, 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 a, or a simulacrum of, of it. So there's this enormous and surprising parallel. So that now introduces the rest of the talk. We've seen that theatres and fairs are fighting for the same audience um, and that theatre gives way to the fairground um, uh, for that. So how is that close connection and sort of rivalry handled? How do fairs make their way into the theatre? Or what does the theatre do with that fairground rivalry? Fairs in theatre. I'm going to start with something um, Shakespearean and quite surprising. Um, and this is, uh, I'm going to look at Shakespeare's reference 
to the man with the performing monkey. Uh, to do this, I need to explain to you about the man with the performing monkey, who one would find at fairs. Um, we get a little of his patter from a, a variety of other bits of literature. Here is one of them, Ram Ali. And this is what you would say and do to your performing monkey. Now sit, your monkey sits. What can you do for the great Turk? Now this is early modern England, we hate Turks. So the monkey doesn't do anything. What can you do for the Pope of Rome? Early modern England, we hate the Pope of Rome. He's even worse than the Turk. So monkey is doing nothing at all, playing dead. Hark, he stirreth not, he moveth not, he waggeth not. Okay, so then you go into a lament. Oh no, my monkey stopped moving. Oh, my monkey's dead. Oh, I wish I'd never mentioned the Turk and the Pope. It's killed my monkey. That is the, uh, so, so that's the patter with the performing monkey. And we hear a bit more of it here in Ben Johnson's play Bartholomew Fair, which is all about Bartholomew Fair, of course. Here we get a reference to a juggler with a well-educated ape who can come over the chain, so jump over a chain for the King of England and back again for the Prince and sit still on his ass for the Pope and the King of Spain. So we get a little more of what happens. He sits still or play, plays dead for the bad people. Here it's the Pope and, and the King of Spain. And you do the lament, my monkey's dead. And then you mention the King of England or um, the Prince. Monkey springs up, jumps about. That is the routine with the performing monkey. And I'm going to go into Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. At this moment, point in Romeo and Juliet, Romeo's gone wandering off. His friends can't find him. And they go into this little bit of patter. He heareth not, he stirreth not, he moveth not. The ape is dead. I must conjure him. I conjure thee by Rosalind's bright eyes. So they're going to conjure him back into life. They're going to conjure him back into life by naming Rosalind his, his then love. Um, that is a really interesting bit of the kind of intertextuality that I was talking to you about that um, is not high literature, uh, not known quotations, but low literature, a type of, of patter. And, and um, I hate using the words high and low because they imply value judgments that, that I don't have at all. Um, uh, but as you can see, Shakespeare uses the monkey patter and he uses it for important points in the play. Um, here the suggestion is that a name, the name Rosalind, will make Romeo be alive again. Um, now actually an, a name, Juliet Montague, ultimately makes him be dead and, and, and the meaning of a name and, and the power of, of a name, uh, a family name, to bestow uh, war and death, that's, that's one of the, the great issues of this play. But here we have it amusingly dealt with but you would only get this if you knew the patter of the man with the performing monkey. Um, let's think of some other bits of Shakespeare that are, are also fairground references. Here is a picture of a man with puppets and you can see the puppets behind. The man in, is in front and he's got a little stick. This man is known as the interpreter. Puppets at that uh, in this point in time and for the next couple of hundred years had an interpreter. The interpreter uh, often said all the words that the puppets would speak. The interpreter also interpreted the puppets to you, the audience, and you, the audience, to the puppets. So he'd point the stick at you, um, uh, give you an insult from the puppets, point the stick at the puppets, give them an insult from you, and so forth. The interpreter, the man who understands people and puppets. Here's a later picture of an interpreter. Um, there you can see the puppets, uh, one hitting and killing another with a big stick, which is something they spent a lot of time doing. And behind them, there's the interpreter with his massive stick, sort of mirroring the puppet stick, um, and interpreting and uh, also luring an audience. 
And here's a further picture of an interpreter with his large stick. And you can see how an interpreter to puppets is something a bit like a conductor uh, to an orchestra. There we have the puppets. These are marionettes here on the stage. There's the interpreter. But I'm mentioning all of this because of a Shakespeare thing. Here, um, Hamlet says to Ophelia, cruelly, I could interpret between you and your love if I could see the puppets dallying. So Hamlet is saying, I could be the interpreter between you and your love. Uh, weirdly, uh, you is Ophelia, your love is him, Hamlet. Um, uh, he's putting them both as puppets and he's offering to be interpreter to the puppets. He's really putting her down by, by uh, making her a dallying puppet and her love a puppet love. But once again, to understand this reference, you need to know puppets. Um, and, and again, you need to know the kind of an entertainment you will largely be dealing with in fairgrounds. And here's a further Shakespeare reference that again has a weird fairground ex, uh, explanation. Uh, it's from Love's Labour's Lost. And there's a, there's a reference to this. How easy it is to put years to the words three and study three years in two words, the dancing horse will tell you. Okay, uh, let me explain that. Um, so the point being made is that three years is a very long time, but two words are, are not very long. And um, uh, surely there's some way of, of, of conflating the three years-ness and the two words-ness. Um, and can it, surely it can be resolved by the dancing horse. So let me now tell you about the dancing horse. Here is the famous dancing horse, Marocus or Morocco. And there is his interpreter, Banks. So he is Banks's horse, Morocco. Um, uh, lots of fairground entertainments had interpreters of this kind. Um, here, Marocus. Uh, is doing his dance. He could stand on his hind legs and, and uh, drum his hooves up and down. It obviously wasn't really dancing, but he was said to be able to dance a caranto. Um, but the other thing is he was said to be a mathematical genius. So you can see that this horse has a couple of uh, dice in front of him. Banks, his trainer, would throw the dice. And as you can see here, it's come out as seven, six and one. And he would say to his horse, what number is that? And the horse would paw the ground seven times. Um, now, of course, he wasn't really a brilliant horse. He was really a trained horse and Banks was secretly telling him what to do. But he was said to be a marvelous, skilled, incredible dancing mathematical horse. And Shakespeare's reference is to him. Shakespeare is saying the dancing horse can surely resolve the three, the th the three year two word thing. But of course the dancing horse couldn't, he could simply add three and two and make five, but that wouldn't help at all. Um, sticking with the dancing horse though, um, for a moment, uh, there are some great stories about this horse. Um, one is that he could do a version of, um, of, of the monkey patter. Uh, so Banks could name something terrible, like the Pope, um, the King of Spain, uh, and so forth. And his horse, Moroccus, could, on hearing the terrible words, do a great P. Um, so that was how that was dealt with. Um, there are other stories. This horse was so famous that Banks took him to France to display him there. Um, but the French were worried, wary of this horse. They thought its genius was demonic. And so they said they would put the horse to death. Banks then took his horse to church where Moroccus got down on his knees and then the French realized that actually he was a very decent holy horse and they didn't kill him after all. Um, but anyway, uh, just to say that um, these give examples of Shakespeare hurrying or to get fairground references into his texts. So all sorts of people who wouldn't necessarily have picked up on the Virgil references might well have picked up 
on the fairground references. And these, of course, are the ones that we are very slow to notice these days. Another Shakespeare such reference. Um, this time I'm starting with the, with the fairground reference. We read of a certain man called Passerton, a most notable juggler. The word juggler, juggler actually meant um, uh, uh, not, not someone who played um, with balls, um, but, but uh, a conjurer. We read of a man called Passerton, a most notable juggler, that was wont to show a banquet to guests and, when he pleased, to make it vanish away again. So the vanishing banquet. Uh, now the way you do a, a vanishing banquet, if you're a conjurer, is you have a, a wooden platter uh, with a banquet stuck on one side and it's got a hinge and you need to flip it really quickly to the other side where there is no banquet. And then you need to flip it really quickly, but you have to do it so quickly that it just seems as though the banquet appears and disappears. So basically you need a ready-made disappearing banquet prop. And why am I referencing this? Um, well, for this reason, here is a stage direction in Shakespeare's Tempest. It says, thunder and lightning, enter Ariel like a harpy, claps his wings upon the table, and with a quaint device, the banquet vanishes. Well, the theater has got hold of this fairground prop. Um, and what I love here is that the theater is kind of really pleased about it. A quaint device, you know, usually stage directions are a bit bloodless, but this, um, quaint means elaborate, this stage direction is, is pleased and proud uh, of the device that it's got hold of. Um, so here we have theater using and embracing fairground, trying to give you the magic and the fun you'd get in the fairground, uh, trying to give you a fairgroundy experience, trying to reference to your, you know, trying to make references to your, your shared fairground loves. Um, and now let's flip this, let's look at it the other way. How then did fairs respond to theatres? Uh, we've said they're kind of the winners, but in what sense, um, or what does that mean in theatre terms? Um, now, when I show you pictures of fairs, they will tend to be from slightly later in time. This is an undated picture, but um, because it, 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 it's, a, it, it's a painting, um, probably uh, late, um, 17th century. Um, but a lot of the points stay true, a lot of the relationship between theatres and fairs uh, stay true throughout the next couple of centuries. This picture just shows you the nature of the theatricality of the fairground. What we have here is this, on the top half of the picture, that's a balcony and you would, in fairgrounds, have these jutting out temporary structures, these balconies or scaffolds, as they were sometimes called. And what you would do, your, your entertainment would be in the building inside. But you'd come out onto your balcony and you'd perform a little bit, a tiny taster, to lure people in. And we can see that on this balcony, a little bit of a performance is being put on in the, in the central bit. Um, there's a woman who seems to be saying no thanks. And there's a clown um, uh, kind of bending to her. This is an, uh, this is an English type of clown um, known as a Merry Andrew. Um, and you, you can see he's got pairs of spectacles and birds on his strange suit. Uh, it's also an interesting uh, picture in other ways because on the right there's a harlequin. That was a continental type of clown. Um, the clowns we have these days are a sort of fusion of the Merry Andrew and the Harlequin, but this was a moment when both of them were happening at the same time. Anyway, you can see a little snippet of play going on in the balcony, but you can also see on either sides in the balcony, people are having a bit of a, the actors are having a bit of a chat. Um, uh, some are paying attention to potential audience below, but a lot of them are not. So there we have one kind of theatricality above. But if we look at the picture below, you can see that the visitors to the fairground are offering a whole other kind of theatricality of their own. 
On the right, you can see there's a very posh carriage with footmen being brought into the fairground. Again, reminding us um, that posh people went to the fairgrounds. Um, and, you know, I should, I should note maybe that Bartholomew Fair, that famous fair, um, was owned by the rich family. They, they owned the territory on, on which uh, it took place and they therefore owned the fair. So it was actually an aristocratic ownership. So here are the residents going to a fair, but just in front of them, you can see lots of people uh, with sticks raised, or clubs raised. Um, uh, these are um, rowdy people having a bit of a, a fight. And on the far left, there's a pretty lady, um, uh, probably a prostitute. So you can see we've got high and low culture um, uh, there, and we've got the posh carriage, and we've also got the fight. And I wonder if the point that this picture is making is that there's actually more theatricality in the audience and the people attending the fair than there is in the theatre above. One reason, of course, that, that there could be theatre of this kind in fairgrounds uh, is, of course, that the theatre theatres continued to close uh, for the next century or so. They continued to close for fairground time and instead the actors would come to the fair um, to perform. And what tended to happen, um, indeed, was that the last play the theatres put on before closing um, for fairground time was Ben Jonson's Bartholomew Fair. So they kind of heralded the, the fair by that crossover play, then closed for actual fair time and became performers in the fairgrounds. This is an amazing fan. I haven't time uh, to talk about it in detail, but I urge you to go to the British Museum site where you can call it up and look at all the details it gives you of Bartholomew Fair and what it was like by the 1730s. Um, at this moment, I just want to, to uh, point out three things of interest, but there are tons of them. Uh, in the very middle, we've got Judith and Holofernes. Um, it, that's a huge advert for a play that will go on inside that booth. That's uh, Lee, the Lee and Harper theatrical booth. So there we've got actual theatre in the fairground. To the left of that, you can see an advert that has a man holding a stick and walking on a rope. We would call him a tightrope walker. Um, at that point, uh, that was known as rope dancing. So there we have a rope dancer. On the right of the Judith and Holofernes advert, and once again you're seeing all these people on, on balconies uh, trying to lure you in. On the right, how fascinating is that? That's a, a ferris wheel. Um, as you can see it's a wheel with people on it and you, it could be cranked around so you could have fairground rides, that's, the, uh, that's um, the predecessor of the fairground rides that we have. Uh, there are also stalls here um, selling entertainment of all sorts, uh, selling uh, Bartholomew babies, uh, that's the name for dolls at that point, um, and selling pork. Uh, pork was a famous Bartholomew Fair item. But this maybe shows more clearly than some of, some of the other things have, that fairgrounds, what fairgrounds taught theatre was that you can sell stuff, because the fairgrounds really existed to sell actual stuff that you can buy and take home with you. But maybe it was fairgrounds that worked out that you could also sell entertainment. And what's great about that is you sell entertainment, but you haven't lost any of your goods uh, by so doing, you just take the money. Um, and theatre is sort of, uh, takes on all of that. So it sells entertainment, but then interestingly, it, as we've seen, it sells goods as well, uh, as I say, in its sort of attempt to do everything that fairgrounds do. Um, well, let's see it other ways uh, um, in which the fairgrounds took on theatre. And one way in particular was that fairgrounds were filled with puppet shows. Um, and puppet shows had a very interesting relationship to theatre. So in brief, puppet shows were often religious. And as you may know, theatre had, um, had specialised in religious plays. 
Um, but Queen Elizabeth had tried to stamp out uh, that sort of play. Um, she, she'd been um, worried about potentials for subversion. Um, what's interesting is that while people uh, couldn't really do their mystery and morality plays anymore, or, or they were being frowned on, um, the puppets could. And that's one of the things about puppets, um, that puppets are, are able to get round censorship. We cannot censor a puppet show. You can, you can uh, approve, allow a puppeteer, but you cannot censor or read his play because they're not written down. Puppets uh, are, are, are a performative but thoroughly oral medium. So briefly, I'll just hop through this actually, because this is just to say that, that, um, that the religious plays um, that had been stamped out in the theater lived on in the puppet world. Um, but I'm going to go to this. Um, this shows us children watching a puppet play. There are three kids on the right. On the left, there's the puppet play. Once again, we've got a man about to hit a lady with a big stick. You did a great deal of hitting in your puppet shows. But um, I want to talk a little bit about the structure of the puppet stage that we see here. You can see that either side of the puppet stage is crenellated. Um, so maybe you won't be surprised to know that the puppet stage was known as the castle. Um, uh, the people stage tended to be identified with the world. The puppet stage, um, probably humorously, uh, because it's so tiny, was uh, associated with, 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 this, with, with something grandiose. Um, anyway, uh, let's think now about what, what we know about early modern theatre taking place in puppet terms in fairs. Here we have a reference from Ben Jonson's uh, Every Woman, from uh, Every Woman in Her Humour. Uh, I pray ye, what show will be here tonight? I've seen the baboons already, the city of New Nineveh, and Julius Caesar acted by the mammoths. Uh, that's puppets. What we're getting here then um, is a description of a puppet show of Julius Caesar. And of course we know there is Shakespeare's play of Julius Caesar. And that's starting to tell us that popular plays uh, would become puppet shows. Now puppet shows wouldn't use the words of the puppet popular plays or not many of them. Puppet shows were something a little bit like fan fiction. Um, the play is so good uh, that it, it uh, asks to be puppetized. And puppets are always a little bit subversive, aren't they? They're always slightly poking fun at something as well as celebrating it. Now, what would then happen is um, you would have your puppet. You've got your puppet, Julius Caesar, say. Um, well, the thing is, you don't want only to put on the play of Julius Caesar. Uh, you're going to want to put on other plays and feature Julius Caesar in them. So, Julius Caesar starts having a whole other life beyond um, his puppet show. Let me show you another puppeteer though, just to give you a sense of how many early modern plays, what sort of early modern play was making it into the puppet world. Um, the puppet world is a strange and odd one. Here we have a puppeteer and what puppeteers would do is they could, they could use scenery, they could have a scenic background in a way you couldn't in the theatre. So this is another way in which puppets kind of were winning over the theatre. And what you tended to have was a lovely background of a city, either in this country or abroad or a place, because after all, people hadn't travelled very much and this was their way of seeing other places and other countries. Um, as I say, you're going to want to give Julius Caesar uh, a bit of an afterlife. And here we get the puppeteer offering this. You shall see the famous city of Norwich, so that's a backdrop, and the stabbing of Julius Caesar in the French capital by a sort of Dutch Mesopotamians. 
Um, okay, so he's muddling everything together, his, his different backdrops, his different puppet characters. And we can also see here why it was that Julius Caesar made it in puppet form. Not so much because Shakespeare's play was so good, um, and I'm assuming this is Shakespeare's play, it needn't be, it could be actual history that's feeding into this puppet. But the big deal about, the Julia, about Julius Caesar is he was stabbed. And there must have been a sort of stabby puppet, which is to say a puppet who's kind of alive on wide, stabbed and dead, you could flop around or something like that. Our puppeteer goes on. Or, if it please, you shall see a stately combat betwixt Tamberlin the Great and the Duke of Guise the Less performed on the Olympic Hills in France. Okay, we're getting a lot of confusion there. But what we're also getting is Tamberlin, the great play by Christopher Marlowe. Um, Tamberlin has become a puppet. And that's another reason for thinking that it's Shakespeare's Julius Caesar that has been puppetized here. Uh, in this play, um, uh, the puppet show is brought to an end. Um, I have confounded their motion. Motion is a puppet show. Beleaguered their castle, as you know, that's the puppet stage. Battered down the walls and taken Tamberlin the blood prisoner. So taken the puppet prisoner in a pursuit to the utter undoing of all motion monger and puppet players. So that's the end of that. But um, as you see, there's this extraordinary weird afterlife that puppets have. Um, and it's interesting to think of which plays it is that make it into puppet form. Let's have a look at this. This is a rare and unusual thing and it's hard to date. It is an advert for a puppet show from Bartholomew Fair. At the top you can see a picture. It's possibly the earliest picture of Mr Punch depending on whether this dates from the 1650s, as some think, or from the 1670s. Um, and uh, you can also see Friar Bacon and Friar Bungay and their talking head. I'll tell you a bit more about that in a second. I'm going to read this advert to you. It says, John Harris's booth in Bartholomew Fair, between the hospital gate and Duck, en Duck Lane End, next to the rope dancers, is to be seen. The court of King Henry II. So that's uh, Davenport's play, Henry II. And the death of Fair Rosamond with the merry humours of Punchinello, that's Punch, and the Lancashire witches. That's, Hay that's the broom play, Haywood and broom play of the late Lancashire witches. As also, the famous history of Bungay and Friar Bacon. So that's Green's play, Friar Bacon and Friar Bungay, with the merry conceits, conceits of their man, Miles, and the brazen speaking head, wherein is represented the manner how this kingdom was to have been walled in with brass. And then it says, acted by figures as large as children two years old. So big old puppets. And then there's a manicure. Mistake not the booth. You may know it by the brazen speaking head in the gallery. So that's an amazing puppet advert. But what it tells you is that a ton of different plays are being all fused together and Mr Punch is running through, through them. Um, well, all these plays will be tending towards humour. That's one thing that puppets do. But as I say, puppets give a strange afterlife to your favourite, favourite play characters. And it gives them an, a parodic and odd afterlife, but it also keeps them going at a time when the theatres are closed, which is a point I'll return to. And once again, let's go forward in time. It's worth going forward in time because at the very same thing happens, which is to say uh, characters uh, who've made it, um, who've become puppets, go on to have a strange puppet afterlife. This is an advert for a series of puppets. I know they look creepy. I know they look like people who are hanging. Uh, these are not hanging people. These are puppets who are hanging up. And it's an advert for Punch's opera with the humours of Little Ben the Sailor. And the advert is being put out by that woman uh, um, uh, who is uh, a woman puppeteer and the daughter of Sibber, uh, Charlotte, um, 
and she's saying, these are my figures of fun, tout nouveau. These are my new puppets. Let's look through the puppets, see who they are. From the left, little Ben. Next to him, Gudgeon. Next to him, Mr. Punch. Next to him, Punch's wife, Joan. Next to her, Bardolph. Well, this is Bardolph um, from the Henry IV, Henry V Shakespeare um, plays. So that's extraordinary. Um, what you can see is there must be um, a, a Henry IV play for which a Bardolph was made, and now Bardolph needs to have an afterlife in other drama. So it also tells us something interesting about Shakespeare. Was he creating characters that were sort of, that were puppet ready? Was he creating characters that were sort of exaggerated enough to make it to the puppet world? And was one of his skills, again, not a high literature skill, but a skill of a kind of characterization that led to a puppet afterlife? And was some of his fame to do with that? Uh, same thing again, happening in the 1740s. Um, let's have a look at this advert. During the time of Bartholomew Fair, will be presented a new dramatic piece called Darius, King of Persia, or The Noble Englishman, with the comical humours of Sir Andrew Aguecheek at the Siege of Babylon. So that is Andrew Aguecheek, who's made it all the way out of Twelfth Night into Darius, King of Persia. Same thing happening. So I'm very interested in this muddled and odd afterlife that Shakespeare and other plays had uh, in the fairgrounds and what that did to their, uh, to their fame and nature. And here's something very important that we should remember. As I said, puppets get under the radar. So when in the, interreg in the interregnum, all theatres were closed for 18 years, it's often said that at that time, we lost our theatrical tradition, we lost our theatres, um, a lot of people lost or didn't have a memory of what theatre had been when theatres reopened in 1660. But that's not quite true. Uh, look at this. This is a, a complaint uh, put out in 1643 by angry actors. This is the actors' remonstrance or complaint for the silencing of their profession and banishment from their several playhouses, the motions of puppets being still in force and vigour. The puppets made it. Um, the puppets were not shut down and in fact went on throughout the interregnum. Plays are down unless the puppet play. The Lancashire Witches, so that's another reference to the late Lancashire Witches, are to be acted this Bartholomew Fair in a puppet play. Um, now, despite the fact that the actors at the top are angry, that means that the cultural memory of what theatre had been was carried on throughout uh, the interregnum, throughout the 18-year uh, closure of the theatre. And it was carried on um, because the puppets had it, because their puppets had got through and they kept that memory. Um, so fairground in this way was tremendously important to theatre. Um, yes, maybe the theatre had to give way to it, but it came to preserve what the theatre had been. Um, so that is puppets preserving them, but just, just briefly, there were other ways in which theatre was preserved in fairgrounds um, over, uh, in the interregnum. When the public theatres were shut up, and the actors forbidden to, uh, to present us with any of their tragedies, then all that we could devote ourselves with were pieces of plays, and that by stealth too, and under pretense of rope dancing. So sometimes actors would pretend to be rope dancers, uh, tightrope walkers, but they'd actually sneakily say little bits of plays uh, to keep that theatre going. That's how it got, got snuck through. Um, that 18 year closure. I'm going to finish on this picture. Um, uh, it's a version, a different version um, of the picture that was used uh, as the advert for this talk. Um, what you can see here uh, is everything that made the play, that made the fair tremendous and everything that made it sort of damaging as well. This is a Hogarth picture and he's showing, um, uh, and, and for him, 
this was at the end of his Rake's Progress sequence. Um, so th this is a sort of final, it's kind of, in a way it's showing the collapse uh, um, of, of, it's showing the collapse of a stage on the left. It's showing um, that, uh, that there's something damaging about theater. Uh, you can also see the rope dancer is falling off his rope. This is, um, the fair here is being a kind of metaphor, I think, for Eng uh, Englishness or Britishness shown there by the central flag. Um, but as well as whatever this picture is saying metaphorically, you can also see um, the huge crowds of the fair, the many booths, um, the entertainment spaces, and you can barely, barely see it. But on the right, um, so there's an advert for the Trojan horse. Then on the right, um, next to that, there's an advert um, uh, for the creation of the world, uh, an Adam and Eve puppet play. Under that, there's a picture of Mr. Punch. And to the right of that, if um, uh, just next to the hobby horse, there are two tiny weeny, weeny, weeny puppets uh, doing their thing. So once again, we've got um, fairground uh, emulating theater and rivaling theater and sort of being theater which is kind of the point that I've been making in this talk. So thank you everyone very much.